we've been discussing how to solve multi-dimensional parabolic partial differential equations. We've worked our way all the way from explicit methods to now ADI type methods applied to these parabolic time marching schemes. And I have one last one to show you. This is the factored ADI method. It will be very similar to the fractional step method or the ADI method with time splitting that I showed you in the previous video, but it has some slight advantages over that fractional step method. So we're once again looking at the unsteady 2D diffusion equation. It has Laplacian on the right, second derivatives of, of u with respect to x and y, and then the partial u partial t term on the left-hand side. Let's start by applying the Crank-Nicholson approximation. So we have a second order accurate central difference in time, uijn plus one minus uij and over delta t. And then in Crank-Nicholson, remember that we average the spatial derivatives at the nth and the n plus first time level. So we have the x derivative in n, x derivative n plus one, y derivative at n plus one, y derivative at n, and then we average those together. Now you notice here I'm using some compact notation. This delta squared is going to represent the second order accurate central difference approximation for these second derivatives. So delta sub x squared operating on uij is this full operator that we're familiar with. Same thing for the delta y squared operating on uij. That's the familiar second order accurate central difference approximation of the second derivative in the y direction. So we're gonna use that co more compact notation here so we can see what's happening more clearly than if we were to write this all out. Okay, so remember we're averaging both derivatives across the n and n plus first time level to get their, their derivatives at the intermediate time level. So again, as always, we pull the unknowns to the left and the knowns to the right. So in this operator notation, we have this in blue operating on the uij at the n plus first time level, and that's equal to this operator operating on the uij at the previous nth time level. Again, unknown and known. Now, forget about this right-hand side for a moment. Let's just look at this blue operator on the left. This is a finite difference operator, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna factor it. It's a factored ADI. So this is how we factor it. So this operator right here, just repeat it, and I'm gonna factor it into the product of these two factors. So you'll notice one times one, well, that's equal to one. One times this minus a half alpha delta t, delta y squared, well, that you see here. And then the one times minus a half alpha delta t delta x squared, well, you see that right here. Now you'll notice there's one additional term that we now have in the factored form that was not present in the original form. And that's when I multiplied this times this. I've repeated it down here to emphasize the fact that you'll notice it's a delta t times a delta t. So it's order delta t squared. The term that's now being included by factoring it in this way that was not in the original difference operator is only order delta t squared. That's the same accuracy of the underlying Craig-Nicholson method. So even though we're introducing this additional error, because this term is not included in the approximation, that error is of the same order as the errors that are already present within the system. So that's perfectly fine. So we're gonna replace this operator with the product of these two factors. So again, factored ADI. And you'll notice we only have the x derivative here and only the y derivative here. So now I'm gonna replace the blue operator here with these two in 640. So the right-hand side will be the same on the next slide. Then the left-hand side is gonna be the product of these two factors here. So that's what we have right here. So that's these two factors, exactly what we had, operating on the uij n plus one and then the operator on the right operating on uijn. Now let's take this red portion and let's define that as a new variable, uij hat. So this whole thing is going to be uij hat, a new variable. And what happens then is this operating on the uij hat equal to this will now be a tridiagonal system because this only involves the three points i, i plus one, and i minus one. So it's compact, only three unknowns, tridiagonal system. So you can see where this is going once again. All right, so that's what you see here. So when we sweep along constant y lines, we're gonna solve this expression here that I just mentioned. It's the x operator operating on this new variable uij hat with all the other stuff on the right. When we solve that, 
all these tridiagonal solves as before, because they're tridiagonal problems, we will actually get a solution for this intermediate variable uij hat. It's not an intermediate time step, as was the case with the fractional step method. It's a different variable. It's an intermediate variable. We actually don't care what it is, but we're going to use that then to get the solution at the next time step, as you'll see. So that's during the first stage of the process, constant y lines. Once again, a whole bunch of Thomas calls to solve each of those tridiagonal problems that are represented by 643. Once you have all those solutions for uij hat, then we look at this expression, 642, flip it around, because now this is known, and this is unknown, so that's the way I've written it here, and we solve those along constant x lines. So the uij hat is now known from step one, and I'm now solving for uij n plus one, where now the operator is only in the y direction. You see that here. So now we have a whole bunch of triagonal solves, all in the y direction to get the solution for uij n plus one at that next time level. So you can see, again, it's very similar to the fractional step method, the ADI method with time splitting, in the sense that we have this ADI type approach, thus the name factored ADI, but it's now slightly different. And let me discuss those differences. So it's very, very similar. It's still the same number of tridiagonal solves, but what you'll notice is for the second one, what's on the right hand side is just these values uij hat. Whereas in the fractional step method, the corresponding right hand side had a whole lot more calculation that had to be done. Still the same number of tridiagonal solves, but a little less calculation, so therefore a little less computational time to get all the coefficients required for the tridiagonal solves. Not a huge savings, but there is some savings. It is second order accurate in space and time, so that makes us happy. It's unconditionally stable for the two-dimensional case that I'm showing here. It's also unconditionally stable for the three-dimensional case as well. You'll remember that in the fractional step method, the 2D case was unconditionally stable, but the 3D case was not. So this improves a bit on the stability for that 3D case. Now to solve 643, we would need boundary conditions for uij hat. So we'd have to develop those from the boundary conditions for u, and then using these relationships determine what those boundary conditions would correspond to for u hat. Now, of course, we could flip this around. There's nothing sacred about my choice of uij hat. I could have equally well defined it as the x operator operating on uij at n plus one. And that would have just flipped the constant x lines and constant y lines. So obviously that was an arbitrary decision on my part. There's no problem with extending this to three dimensions, still second order accurate in time. We would then have three sets of tridiagonal solves, as would be the case for the fractional step method. But again, no additional hit in terms of numerical stability. We could also incorporate up and down and differencing in the same way that we did a couple videos ago using the Crank-Nicholson method. So that works really well. So the method remains compact, only involving the point itself, points to the right, left, up and down, so north, south, east, and west, in maintaining second order accuracy in both space and time. Now, as we finish up this chapter on parabolic equations, let me make some general comments about these parabolic time marching schemes relative to the iterative elliptic schemes that we discussed in the last chapter. One thing you'll remember is from the elliptic schemes, the issue is iteration. How can we be sure that the process will converge? Not only that, but how fast will it converge? So even if Jacobi would converge, we still prefer Gauss-Seidel because it would converge faster. Even though Gauss-Seidel would converge, we prefer SOR because it would converge faster. Even though SOR, ADI is faster. ADI is great, but multigrid is even faster. So we're very focused on the convergence rate. How many iterations would be required? Here, that's not a concern because we're not iterating, except in the nonlinear cases where we do have some iteration. But in the time marching aspect, the issue now is numerical stability. And as we discussed in an earlier video, stability is stability. There is no such thing as something being more unstable. It's either stable or it's unstable. The small errors either grow or they decay. So that led to our discussion earlier about a pseudo-transient method. So there are situations where when we actually want to solve the elliptic problem, such as a steady heat conduction problem that would correspond to this, so there's no time derivative, it may actually be better to solve the 2D unsteady diffusion equation that we've been highlighting here, let it go until it converges to a steady state, 
and then we have that steady state solution. We may actually get the solution faster than using an elliptic technique because of the nature of stability relative to iterative convergence rate. And then there's one other thing that I've been harping on and emphasizing all throughout our discussion in elliptic problems and parabolic problems as well. And that is the advantage of boiling things down to triagonal systems of equations, because then we can use the Thomas algorithm. So in fact, the methods that we've just been discussing in these last few videos have all been answering the question in different ways. How can I get the time marching process to boil down to simply solving triagonal systems because it is so efficient. It's order n operations. It doesn't get any better than that. If I double the number of points, it only doubles the amount of time. That's the best I can hope for. So if we can boil these more complex problems down to these triagonal solves, all the better. So that's been a lot of the motivation behind the techniques that we've been showing you throughout the elliptic as well as the parabolic cases is to show how we can take these more complex situations and boil them down to a whole bunch of triagonal solves to take advantage of this efficient Thomas algorithm. Now as we finish up this chapter, I would encourage you to go back and kind of think through and summarize what I mentioned down here. In these multidimensional methods, look at where the x marks the spot is, right? Where are we approximating the equation in all these different methods? What are the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages? Why don't we use explicit methods all the time? Why don't we use the first order implicit method all the time? Why did I discuss two different ADI methods? So make sure it's clear in your mind why each successive method that we've discussed is better than the previous ones. This again is the piece de resistance, but I want you to see what the steps that led to this and why this is better than even a fractional step in ADI with time splitting.